Welcome to Bigfoot Case Files, true stories of encounters with Bigfoot. I finally made the decision to share my experiences after listening to a podcast earlier today. My experiences happened on an 18-acre property my son had rented in Aromas, California. My son leased this piece of property back in 2011. It has a small house, but is mostly forested area. It always seemed a little weird out there. I lived on the property in a trailer from late 2013 to early 2017. My first experience was in late 2011 when I was working for my son and I decided to stay one night instead of driving back to Santa Cruz where I lived. I was sleeping in my camper with my dog when at around 4 in the morning we were awoken by the most awful scream that seemed to last forever. It sounded like someone was being skinned alive. I've never heard anything like it. In the morning, I asked others if they had heard it, and everyone said it had woken them up too. None of us could figure out what it was. My son had been having strange things go on all around the property. Strange noises, things going missing, strange lights all around. No one ever mentioned Sasquatch as a possibility. The next experience was just about a year later, when my son had some friends and myself again working for him. It was around 9 at night, and there was a group of guys out on the porch talking. Suddenly, a huge bush, approximately 25 feet from the house, started shaking violently, and something started running unbelievably fast up and around the back of the house on a game trail there, and you could hear the thunderous footsteps going all the way down the side of the property. It must have covered 150 yards in about a minute, crashing through brush, making all sorts of noise. It so scared some of the guys, they refused to come back to work and haven't set foot on the property since. The next day, I was standing in the front yard talking to one of the guys that stayed, and I swear, a brick came sailing into the yard and dropped right between us, like it had fallen from the sky. We stood dumbstruck and could not figure out who had thrown it, or from what direction it came. About this time, it was becoming apparent that something strange was going on around this property. For the most part, we tried to ignore everything, hoping that it would stop or go away. It wasn't long after I started hearing someone walking through the bush around the house at night. Though every time I looked, no one was there. Even the dogs, two 90-pound pit bulls, were getting nervous and acting kind of nutty. The following year, I moved out to the property in a trailer. My son lived in the house on the top of a hill, and I lived a good 200 yards down the hill by the front gate. Unfortunately, the only place to put the trailer was in the way of the game trail that I mentioned earlier. It ran along the entire side of the property. I should also mention that there's a heavily wooded area adjacent to where I had put my trailer, and it ran along the driveway. It was on the neighbor's property. This was the strangest looking wooded area I had seen. Quite a few of the trees were snapped off at around eight or nine feet above the ground, and they were pointed in different directions. I'm sure winter storms had something to do with it but it was too uniform and the trees weren't always angled in the direction of the storms. Plus, there were more than a few that had huge branches turned sideways and looked to be placed in the other trees. It looked contrived and spooky. Not long after moving out there, I thought I could see bare footprints down around the gate, but they weren't big, more like the size of my feet. This area was really rough and no one I know would be walking around without shoes. Soon after, I found a foot impression out in our lower field, which I photographed. At this point, Bigfoot was becoming a possibility. After having more bizarre instances occurring, I decided to reach out to a paranormal investigator. She came out, listened, and we walked the game trail along the property. She mentioned how many trees were snapped all at the same height. Then we caught sight of this structure that was about three feet tall and perfectly round, dome-like, and made out of branches woven together. This was not a natural event. It definitely had been made by someone, and it was in a place where no one goes off this game trail. At this time, she referred me to the local Bigfoot organization for further investigation. It took some time, but eventually they came out. This in itself, a bit of a story, needless to say. The other events were as follows. I was coming up the driveway at 10 p.m., and noticed a tall man in our greenhouse. When he saw my headlights, he bolted and ran up the hill. I don't know where to. My son asked if I had seen him as well. 
One night I was standing at the door of my trailer and I look over to a thicket about 40 feet from my trailer and I saw this thing with, I shit you not, red glowing eyes. I always thought that was a myth, but these red glowing eyes were just watching me from behind these huge bushes. I couldn't see its body as it was too dark, but I guessed it to be about six feet plus tall and it didn't seem mad, but more curious and just watching. I thought I had lost my mind, so I went in the trailer, waited a couple of minutes, went back outside, and it was still there. This happened two or three more times, and the last time it was gone. I had one last experience early 2016 when I was up at my son's house. I noticed that all the usual noises around had gone quiet, that creepy quiet that happens when a predator is near. I walked outside and got a whiff of the worst smell ever. By this time, I was pretty sure what it meant. There were two other people at the property around that time that also mentioned a weird putrid smell that day. These are just a portion of the occurrences that happened there. I since have moved, but only about eight miles away. And again, I'm experiencing abnormal events, although these seem to have a different source. There have been numerous sightings that were reported to the local Bigfoot investigator's office in this exact area. There's a great food source from the local farms and ranches. I believe we are on their migratory route because everything seemed cyclical in nature. I'd be interested in your take on these events. While the Bigfoot investigators were here, one gentleman had such a profound experience that he said it changed his life. He has some pretty interesting trail cam footage as well. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. Unfortunately, no further information pertaining to this report has been found. I'm an older lady and I don't type very well, but I will try my best. I had a great relationship with my dad. We were very close and he told me things that he never told anyone else. I looked up to him and trusted him completely. He was my rock, and I adored him. When I was 12 years old, my younger brother nagged my parents to take him camping. They really did not want to go, so they kept delaying it. Finally, a friend of my dad said he could use his hunting cabin for the weekend. My mom felt better about it because it was not a tent, and she was a city girl. So we packed up some supplies and the directions, and off we went. We went on a Friday evening. Dad got home from work. We live in New Jersey, so the trip to Pennsylvania only took a few hours. The first problem came when we got lost in the backwoods somewhere. The directions took us down some very thick parts of the woods. It was just getting dark when we arrived at the cabin. It had not been used for years, but it did have four bunks, a table, four chairs, and a portable potty chair. That was like a wooden chair with a hole in it, and a bucket full of dirt and wood chips mixed together was under it. By the end of the night... My mother would get to know that chair very well. It must have been around 10 p.m. when we started hearing movement outside the cabin. Mom was a very nervous lady, easily excitable. The cabin had these wooden shutters inside and a piece of wood that could be lowered down in front of them to secure them. She went to the windows, slammed them shut, but there was a gap in between the two sides that you could peek out of. Soon, we heard banging on the sides of the cabin. It started in the front, and the banging continued all the way around the cabin. My dear mother got so scared she couldn't hold back her bowels and ran for that old wooden potty chair. She screamed, It's a bear! and started to say her prayers. I don't think God approved of her timing, but that was all she felt she could do. This continued for hours, and poor Mom began throwing up as well into garbage bags. Daddy positioned himself in front of the door, he sat calmly in a chair with his two loaded shotguns by his side. My little brother fell asleep in one of the bunks and never heard a thing. Hours went by and the creature started throwing large rocks at the cabin. The roof was metal and the rocks banged on the top and rolled down and they were so loud. I couldn't believe my brother never woke up. I went over to my dad and sat next to him. I wanted to be close to him because it made me feel better. I knew as long as daddy was close by... All would be made right with the world. I asked him a very important question. Earlier, I saw him looking out the gap in the shutters. I wanted to know if bears threw rocks. He said, I don't think so. Then I asked him, what did you see outside the window? 
he said, a big creature. This creature kept this up for about five hours. Then Mum's prayers were finally answered. It started to rain, thunder, and lightning. The creature gave up and went away. When first light came, my dad packed up the car. He helped my mother to get him because she was so weak. All the way home, my brother was complaining and wanted to know why we left so soon. My mother told him to shut up. Three times he asked, when can we come back? She said, never. That was her last camping trip. My name is Brandy. I heard this kind of giggling of more than one child and the singing of a song sounding very much like the tune of Ring Around the Rosy, which then led directly into a scream like I've never heard in my life. This happened right outside our bedroom window as we shut off the light. Only recently have I come to finally understand that Bigfoot would harass my three-year-old son by peering at him through the bedroom window and tapping on the window to gain his attention. My son said the Bigfoot enjoyed it very much when my son would crash his Tonka trucks together. The creature would then quietly make sounds of amusement and become excited and wait for my son to repeat the action. While I didn't know that, there's a man with long hair out my window, was a Bigfoot at that time. I know it now. My little guy just didn't have the language to tell me exactly what he was seeing, only that he was scared of it. Several times he came to me saying that the man with long hair was out on the road or out the bedroom window, but I didn't get a look at it. My son told me recently I think he wanted me to go with him. He's reluctant to talk about it because it's frightening to recall. He did tell me it looked like a really tall gorilla, not black in color, but dark brown with a pointy head. We now believe the creature entered our home on the third day we lived there. My husband would leave every morning between 5.30 and 6 a.m. I was home with our three kids, two girls aged eight and five, and our son, three. I woke one morning to find large muddy prints that started at my front door, tracked down the hallway to enter each bedroom, then trailed back up the hall to the living room where it uprooted my potted palm plants and picked all the peppers from my ornamental pepper plant. There were no peppers left at all. The prince did a circuit of my living room, then left the way it came. The front door stood wide open. I blamed my husband and called him at work to chew him out. Poor guy was so confused. See, the prints were so large, I assumed they had come from my husband's work boots, which are much like logging boots. Bigfoot wasn't even on my radar at the time, even though we lived in the Ozark Mountains on Beaver Lake only a stone's throw from the War Eagle area in northwest Arkansas, where there were Bigfoot and monster reports going way back. We even had a weird experience the first night we spent in the house. Now that I've heard these creatures imitate sounds, I believe this is what happened the first night. We had every weird Bigfoot activity happen to us as well. Rocks thrown onto the roof, window taps, weird calls and screams from the woods at night. I'd even hear the flippin' doorbell ringing, but the sound came from outside. We're still recalling all the weird things we ignored so easily. My Native American grandmother, Yankton Sioux Tribe, told me stories about them when I was little. She said they would watch them come down from the trees along the Missouri River in South Dakota. She told of how several Bigfoot trapped them at the home of friends her family was visiting. Anyway, that's part of what we experienced. My name is Howard. I want to relate to you a sighting I had as a child in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. My mother, originally from California, was adopted by a couple who lived in this area. It is a beautiful region with the Illinois River literally in their backyard. We live in the central part of the state, and as a child we would go and visit my Grandpa Pete and his wife. They lived in a cabin that they built because Grandpa Pete was a Cherokee elder, so everyone in the area was of Cherokee descent. This place was a kid's paradise. On the day I saw the man at the river, I was 11 and my brother 13. We went to play in the old cabin they moved out of a few years back. As I said, you could see the river from the old cabin. We were just being kids and playing when my brother said, look at the guy by the water. I finally figured out what he was looking at and that's when I noticed it was covered in hair. It was about 100 yards away, so detail was tough. My thought never went to Bigfoot, as I didn't know what that was at the time. I'm now 48. B 
Being a smart-ass kid, and this guy was clearly on my grandpa's property, so I yelled, Hey! This is where it all went south. This man turned and screamed. Then it bolted running down the tree line, eventually disappearing. I really just thought it was a person, so we started back playing as kids do. Out of nowhere, the neighbor came running to us, ordering to get to the cabin. Once we got inside, Grandpa Pete and the guy went back outside. They were speaking Cherokee, so I had no clue. When Grandpa Pete returned, he asked what we saw, so we both told him the same thing. We were not allowed past the first cabin for the whole weekend. When we asked who the guy was, he said, The river belongs to them right now, so don't go down there. They're just passing through. I'm 44 years old. I'm currently bed-bound and disabled from a horrible accident at work in Florida around 2005. I hit a 3,000-pound bull with a semi. I did a few years of therapy and was able to go back to work. About four years ago, I slipped and fell at my job three times in two days. Due to both accidents compounding, it's got me back to being bed-bound, and now I can't walk. Back when I was around 21 or 22 years old, I was living in North Florida, Cotto, Florida to be exact. A friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go hunting on a piece of land that his dad owned. His dad owned a huge piece of land like over 2,000 acres in Compass Lake in the hills, Florida, about 15 to 20 miles from my house. So, I remember I had a 306 rifle and my friend had a 308 rifle. We left to go hunting around 4 p.m. That evening, driving to the property was all unfamiliar to me. I have hunted in a track close to this property before. However, I didn't know the layout of this property and told my friend just before we parked that what if we got separated? I've never been there. I worried because I left my truck at my house and we drove to the property where we were going to hunt in a two-man tree blind. My friend laughed at me and said nothing to worry about. He knew the land and he said he was worried about nothing. Well, was he wrong? We got to where we were parking the truck and had to walk for a solid hour to the hunting stand. As we were walking in, I noticed that there was literally no animal life around us at all. No birds, no squirrels, no deer tracks or any sign that life ever lived there. It was just a quiet, almost dead feeling walking into those woods. We walked a fire trail the most of the way back to the hunting stand. At around 5.30 p.m., we made it to the stand and climbed up and got settled in. I'm a great thinker and problem solver. I was sitting there thinking that it was already 5.30 p.m., and it gets dark around 8 p.m. or so this time of year. In my head, I did the math. I told my friend in a soft voice, so we didn't scare away any of the deer or hogs or anything, that we might want to head out in about an hour or so. I certainly didn't want to walk on a track that I wasn't familiar with to get back to the truck in the dark. My friend again laughed at me and said, No worries, brother. We have plenty of time before we have to leave. Over an hour went by, and I finally said to my friend, Look, I'm headed back with or without you. I'm leaving now. So my friend said, okay, and called me a wuss. We climbed down and headed back to the truck with maybe 30 to 45 minutes of daylight left. We were about halfway back, and just like that, we had no light at all. It was dark, and we didn't bring a flashlight with us. I remember walking behind my friend when I started smelling a wet dog or animal smell. It was awful. Enough to gag a maggot, it smelled so bad. Around 20 minutes or so from the truck, we were walking on a small trail or fire trail, getting closer to a little island of trees that sits right in the middle of the trail, just in front of us, around 50 yards away. As we got closer, the smell got stronger and stronger. We just put it off as a dead buzzard or a dead skunk. Then all of a sudden, there was a big bang on that island of trees in front of us. My friend and I stopped dead in our tracks. I said to him, Hey, what was that? He was so scared he couldn't even answer me at all. I told him something big was on that island of trees just in front of us, and now how are we going to get out of here and back to the truck? Just as my friend was about to say something, there was a noise that I'll never forget. It was a roar that was so loud that the decibels shook the ground around us. I grabbed my friend and said, We have to go and go now. We started walking away from the island of trees toward the right-hand side as to stay as far away as possible from the Bigfoot in those thicket of trees. Around ten steps in, it started to roar again and hit the trees with a log or something. 
To be honest, I'm 250 pounds of muscle and was a football athlete all my life. I've never been scared of anything. This was different. I know that Bigfoot would rip my friend and I apart with no problems. I dropped my gun and ran for my life back to the truck. My friend still had his gun. He was only 160 pounds wet. I made it back to his truck about two minutes before he did. That's saying something because of our sizes that my friend should have beat me back first. When we jumped in the truck, I looked at my friend and said, I dropped my gun. Let's go now. I remember we drove home in less than half the time it should have. And when my friend dropped me off at my house, he said to me, what the F was that? And I told him that we knew what it was and that I'll never go anywhere near that property again. My friend said, well, you dropped my dad's prize gun and then he'd have to go back and get it. Good luck, I said. I never told anyone what happened that night. The next day, my friend showed up at my house and said that he found the gun, but no signs of anything else. It's been over 20 years now from the Bigfoot experience I had. I'm now 44 years old with serious health problems and felt I have to tell my story. And my friend and I are lucky to get out of there alive. Thanks. Back in 2014, I was driving my family home. We lived in Berryville, Arkansas at the time, from visiting my dad in the hospital in Springfield, Missouri. It was summer, around 9 p.m., and it was mostly dark. I mean mostly, as in you could still somewhat see, but definitely needed headlights. We were coming through a heavily wooded area around Cosmic Caverns, and I was on the lookout for deer since they like to run out on the road at this time of the year. I was having a conversation with my wife when a huge black mass came running up out of the ditch toward the car from the woods which are probably only 20 to 30 feet from the road. It was massive, much taller than the car, and the speed in which it came at us from the ditch scared all of us. I shouted and swerved as I knew we were going to hit it, but did not. My wife asked me what the heck that was, and I told her I thought I knew, but I didn't want to say. She asked, Bigfoot? I said, I think so. It was huge. I didn't think they were in this area. I would have discounted all of this if it weren't for what happened later. So the really interesting part happened the next day when we got to church. The pastor's wife, who regularly ridicules her son, who is my age, for believing in Bigfoot, approached me with a strange look on her face. She says, you're not going to believe what I saw last night. I knew she lived around the Cosmic Cavern area, so I jokingly said, a Bigfoot around Cosmic Cavern around 9 p.m.? Her jaw falls open and she shoves me back and says, how did you know? I told her that we had driven through that area at around that time and something had rushed the car. She told me that she had driven through that area 15 minutes before we did and saw a massive black figure standing at the wood line. So anyways, that's my story. We moved out into the woods in the Eureka Springs area this summer and have had a few strange things happen since. Stephen. My encounter took place in 1984 near Dryden, Ontario, Canada. My best friend Bob lived in the bush 30 miles from Dryden. His closest neighbor was 13 miles away. I went up to see him in July. We went camping at a bush lake 20 miles from his house. That night, something big was walking back and forth behind the tent. At first, I thought it was a bear. I was scared. Every bear attack I ever read about flashed before my eyes. Bob said, Mark, if something comes through this tent, lay still and don't raise up. And I said, why? He lit his lighter and he had a double-edged boot knife swinging it back and forth. Now I'm really scared. I told Bob, I can't stay in this tent. Let's get a fire going. And he said, okay. The only light we had was a candle in a coffee can. Bob lit the candle and he said, you go first. And I said, why me? And he said, I got the knife. At the time, none of this was funny. But now, me and Bob laugh about the shit we did and said that night. I crawled out of the tent, stood up, shining that coffee can all around, looking to see what was going to get us. We went down to the rock by the lake, got a fire going, and this thing kept walking back and forth behind the tent. By now, we both know what it was. The word Bigfoot was never said, but we knew. We had a radio in the tent. The batteries went dead, so we never turned it off. 
All at once, that radio started screeching and making the loudest sounds I've ever heard. We both jumped about two feet in the air, and Bob said, Oh my God, it's eating the old lady's radio. And he said, You have to go shut it off. And I said, Why me? And he said, I got the knife. So there I went up to the tent with the coffee can, with Bob right on my heels. I thought it was in the tent, so I took baby steps to the tent, dreading every step I took. I peeked in the tent, nothing was in there, so I crawled in and shut the radio off. I think when the radio went off, it scared him as much as us, because it was gone. Then we heard a loud, shrill whistle. A few minutes later, it was back, walking behind the tent. This went on most of the night, but we heard the whistle only one more time. When the sky started getting light in the east, it was gone. We never seen it, but we both knew it was a Bigfoot. I have some questions about that night. Why didn't it throw stuff at us? Why didn't it scream at us? What made the radio come on? Mark. August 5th, 2017, San Bernardino National Forest, California. I'm an avid hiker, so much that I like hike every weekend in the forest. I'm 47 years old and have experience in this. On Saturday, August 5th of 2017, I was with my girlfriend and we decided to go hiking in the San Bernardino National Forest, Big Bear. As we were driving up the old Highway 38 route, we were having a good conversation. Then about 10 miles away from Big Bear City, she said, I saw a monkey. I slowed the car and asked her, what? She said, I saw a monkey standing on the side of the lower part of the mountain. She continued saying, it was standing up straight on two legs and looking our way as we were driving. By now, I couldn't stop due to heavy traffic coming from behind us. Highway 38 there isn't a lot of room to pull off, so we kept driving. I asked her what it looked like. She stated it looked like a monkey, but as big as me. She stands 5 feet 6 inches tall, same as me. It was dark brown in color and standing on 2 feet in legs. It had long arms and looking at the road where we were driving. She wasn't sure about the weight, but if it was as big as her and I, it had to have been around 130 to 170 pounds. It got kind of quiet, and we talked about it being a possible Bigfoot. I left it at that. I didn't want to press my luck. So now back to our day out. As we drove through Big Bear City to find our destination, we found the road that led to one of many hiking trails. It was called Pine Knot Trail. We geared up and hit the trail that day. We talked and enjoyed ourselves. About four miles in the forest off the trail, I noticed something odd. It was out of place. A very tall tree standing around 70 feet or more, but with a huge portion of another tree stuck in the middle of it. It appeared to be snapped off on both ends, and roughly estimated height was around 8 feet. This massive piece of tree was placed in the middle of this standing tree. Now that piece didn't fall, and it didn't belong from that area of trees. It didn't fit. I immediately started to record it on my iPhone. As I looked around, we both noticed other breakings around. She was trying to rationalize it, saying it was lightning, but there were no burn marks, and what happened to the rest of the tree? We continued on our hike and started to notice along the trail, tree breaks, Branches weren't broken, but twisted and pointing downwards. I told her, just keep walking. I had my hand on my machete. I always carry one with me on the side of my right leg. We walked past a campsite. People were talking and laughing. We continued on and made it to part of our destination, Skyview Point. We were at 7,000 feet elevation, sitting on a rock, looking out. We had lunch and rested. We geared back up and decided to walk a different trail back. That's when things changed for us. It went from a good day to a nervous situation really fast. We had walked about three miles in on this trail, cabin trail, then we heard a loud grunt, and we could hear something walking in the tree line down about 30 feet away from us. We never saw it, not at first. This lasted about 35 minutes on this trail. Then we stopped. We couldn't hear any birds, squirrels, nothing. As we walked, the trail got thicker and deeper in the woods. I stopped and waited for about five minutes, looking around and listening. We heard nothing. I removed my machete, and I told my girlfriend to hold her knife in her hand. The one she had was only six inches long. It was better than nothing. 
I walked first, with her hanging on with her left hand on my pack. As we walked through the thicket, it was now almost as tall as us. We heard something walking through the trees and bush above us on our left, about 20 feet away. Then we heard a loud whistle to the right of us. She was almost in tears. I had the feeling of, we're not going home today. I was scared. All I knew was that I would try my best to protect my girl. Shortly after this happened, we picked up a nasty smell, like a wet dog and trash is the only way I can describe it. It was foul. We were trying to decide at this point if we should turn back, but we knew we had gone in pretty far, so we decided to keep walking through the bush. These things that were following us from both sides were taunting us, letting us know they were there. Finally, we made it to a clearing at the top of the trail. It was a logging site. No one around. Empty cabins. I knocked on a couple of doors, and nothing. There were big tractors and other equipment around, but we were the only ones there. I noticed ADT security signs, so I figured if I had to, I would kick in a door or window and set the alarm off. But we decided to walk on. We were walking down the clear part of the trail. We immediately looked back and saw a very large creature walking quickly across the trail in back of us, about 50 feet away. It was large, about seven feet, and weighed maybe 400 pounds. Long brown hair, not fur. We didn't see a face, but it was big. We walked really fast, still with my machete in my hand. We picked up the pace for about 50 feet and came across a paved road. We then saw a large four-door SUV, and there were four guys in it. They stopped and asked us if we were okay. We said yes. They asked us if we came from Cabin Trail, and we said yes. The front passenger said, We never hang around that area if we don't have to. As he was talking, I noticed he had a 308 rifle with a big scope mounted on it. The driver told us to follow the road, that we weren't far away from where we parked at the trailhead. They were the only ones we saw out there that day, until we arrived at the car. It was a quiet ride home. I felt like crying afterwards, and I was trying my best to hold it together. We haven't been back to that trail since then. Thank you if you do read this. In the San Bernardino Mountains at the Barton Flats campground, southwest of Big Bear Lake, I was sleeping in my van and my two friends were sleeping in a tent about 15 feet away. I couldn't get to sleep and I heard something walking around outside. I could hear snoring coming from the direction of the tent and when I peeked out the window I couldn't see anything. I started to get up, and all of a sudden, the van started rocking violently back and forth, and I was thrown from side to side. I yelled real loud, and the shaking stopped. My friends called from the tent and asked what the problem was, and at that point, I grabbed my flashlight and pulled back the curtains covering the back window and shined the flashlight outside. A figure moved towards the left, and I could see it was walking upright like a man, but it had hair from head to toe and in a second I saw it walk past the front windshield and head into the forest. I pulled open the side door and jumped out, yelling for my friends to get up. It smelled really bad, like a cesspool around our campsite, and I was badly shaken. We started a fire and talked about what had just happened, and I learned that something had been tossing pebbles onto the top of the tent, and they thought it was me. Then something had brushed up against the back of the tent, and they also thought it was me. But after I told them about the van shaking, they swore it wasn't them, and we decided to pack up and head home early. Later, I remembered seeing a pair of glowing yellowish eyes through the trees after we had first arrived, but they disappeared almost immediately, and I figured it was just a deer or something to that effect. Don't forget to enter the October Bigfoot Case Files giveaway contest if you already haven't. Just watch the video linked on your screen Comment what the secret word is, along with your favorite story. Follow the rules posted in the description. Then you will be entered to win some great prizes. Good luck.